tongue tied a few times. I kept saying animals, uh, meat strangled by animals. It's meat, uh, uh, animals strangled. You're not supposed to eat that meat. <laughs> and I kept getting into this phrase, animals strangled by, when, when do you ever see an animal strangled meat? <laughs> no. But it's, you don't want to eat meat that's strangled because the blood is in it. And I mentioned something that I want to bring clarity to as well. That when there was a sacrifice in the Old Testament, the meat, when the blood was drained, and the meat was on the burnt offering, but the blood was still sacred, it was special, that was sprinkled on the altar. And, and it's really unique that the, the Lord separated the blood before the burnt offering. And did you notice when Christ was on the cross? He was hanging there, he was the sacrifice. But the Roman soldier put the spirit in and the blood flowed out. Water and blood flowed out. Even in that sacrifice, God separated the blood from the body. And that's something I just wanted to point out to you. So um, we are in Acts 16 this week. And man, God is just good. Even little things like that, that we just read by a hundred times. But when you read it in the light of the Old Testament, you go, wow, that's why that spear went in there. Water and blood flowed out. Because in the sacrifice, the blood was removed from the animal. But Christ was the lamb. The blood came out. Amazing, huh? So we are in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 talks about Paul's missionary journey. It's the second missionary journey. When I say second missionary journey, it's really not. It'll be known by scholars and by the Bible as the second missionary journey. But it's really journey 2.1. Because Paul took off in the chapter, in the previous chapter, by himself and went into some little cities. That was really the second. It was like, or maybe that was missionary journey 1.0 or 1.2. But this is Paul's second missionary journey. It takes place in the last few verses of Acts 15, Acts 16, and Acts 17. The where on this, you're going to see a lot of cities. And this is not all the cities he went to in his missionary journey. This is just what's in Acts 16. Acts 17 is more verses, more cities. But the cities here are Derby, Lystra, Iconium, uh, Troas, uh, Neapolis, Philippi, Thyatira. And the regions, if you can imagine um, like counties, and the counties have cities, or even states and they have cities, these are the regions. Sicily, Galatia, Pergia, Mysia, Bithyn Bithynia, Macedonia, and there was an island, uh, Smothrace. And we're going to read about all these places. The when is the same as Acts, the second part of Acts 15. It's still 49 AD. And remember, the book of Galatians was written 49 AD. The key people in here are Paul, Silas, and we're going to introduce two new people, Timothy and Lydia. Now, Paul, remember in the last uh, outline I gave you, it said Pale. Paul didn't change his name to Pale, it was a typo. But he is Paul. Paul, Silas, uh, Timothy, and Lydia. There, I added a little thing in here called key events. There are two things that happen in this chapter that we need to know about. One is the Macedonian call, and the second is the first European convert. If there was a key event that I would have wrote for the last chapter, uh, or chapter 11, what would it have been? Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. Remember that? So, uh, so these are some of the neat things that we're going to talk about. So before we get to Acts 16, I want to go back into Acts 15, because that's where the missionary journey starts. And we're going to go in verse 39. Acts 15, verse 39, if you have your Bible. It says, They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. This is Paul and Barnabas. And remember the disagreement, it'll say it right here. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria, Cilicia, and Sicily, strengthening the churches. So this is where the missionary journeys are beginning, the second one. Verse 1 of chapter 16 now. It's in your study guide. Um, verse 1. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, uh, where the disciples named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and had a, uh, and a believer, whose father was a Greek. 
The believers of Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Uh, if we go over to our maps right there, I want to show you right where they're at. You see um, the island of Cyprus right above the number seven right there? You see number seven? Straight up from there, you'll see uh, Lystra and Derby. You'll see Iconium, all those areas. It's in the region of Galatia. The book of Galatians was written to all that region, the Galatians, okay? So that's where Timothy lived. Uh, Timothy lived in Derby. And you know what's really neat? Is that is also where Tarsus is, just about. Paul of Saul of Tarsus, he's in that same area. That's where he's from, okay? One thing I want to point out is this Timothy is the same Timothy that both epistles were written to. First and second Timothy, that's the same one. And um, the one thing, another thing I want to point out is this. It says Timothy was only half Jewish and he was half Greek. A lot of times we think, unless we're 100% of anything, that especially Jewish, you know, because they're the chosen people, that can God really use me? I mean, I'm not Jewish. I'm not, I mean, some of us might say, you know, I might be a hundred different nationalities or I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, we'll say. I was maybe on the wrong side of the tracks. How can God ever use me? God doesn't look for that which is perfect. He looks for vessels that he can perfect. It doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter if we're rich, poor, uh, uh, black, white. It doesn't matter anything. It doesn't, what matters is, are we a vessel that God can use? And I'm going to tell you, when God uses vessels, he doesn't pick up the bright, shiny ones. He looks for those ones that are held together with super glue. You know, those ones with holes in it, with cracks. He looks for those ones because, do you know why? If you put a, a, a candle in that shiny vessel, you can't see the candle. You put it in that one with the holes in it, it lights up the room. Yeah, that's good. And that's, I heard somebody say that once. I go, man, that's awesome. I want to be, I'm a broken pot. I'm a broken piece. But you know what? That's where the light shines. Amen? Mm -hmm. I remember who told me that, but I thought, that's awesome. Uh, verse 3. It says, Paul wanted to take uh, him along on the journey as Timothy. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew his father was a Greek. All right. Stop. Wait. Stop the press. <laughs> wait a minute. Do you remember what we studied last week? Mm -hmm. Circumcision. Who was adamant against it? Paul and Barnabas. When you read the book of Galatians, which talks about law and grace focused around circumcision, Paul even says in, 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 um, in Galatians 2, 3, and 4, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because false believers had infiltrated the ranks to spy our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ and to make us uh, slaves. So when we read in Galatians, it's for freedom you've been set free. Or you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Paul is talking about circumcision and the law. And, and we see here, Paul circumcises Timothy. Does it sound hypocritical? A little bit, don't it? But unless you see the full picture, you, you understand. See, when Paul went to, uh, he was in Antioch. Remember? Antioch is just above Jerusalem. If you look at your map, you should see Antioch there. Now, let's look at your map real quick. I just want to show you something. There are two Antiochs. There's an Antioch in the region of Pisidia. See the region of Pisidia right above Lystra? Right above Derby? There's an Antioch. That's in the region of uh, Pisidia. But if you go to the right of your map in Syria, there's another Antioch. That's the Antioch where the church that Paul persecuted in Jerusalem fled to. And that became the church that sent out missionaries throughout the known world at that time. And what happened was there were Jews that came from Jerusalem to Antioch saying, you've got to be circumcised. And Paul says, wait a minute. There's believers here in Antioch that are Greeks. They're Gentiles. They know nothing of the law. How are you going to tell them to be circumcised? So he fought against it. He went to Jerusalem. He pled his case before Peter and before uh, James. Do you remember? 
And they sent him a letter saying, all right, you don't need to be circumcised, but do these things. So why did he circumcise Timothy? If he was so adamant against it, the same year, mind you, it was still 49 AD, 40, well, 48, 49, what changed his heart? Nothing. It's what it says in verse 3. It says, He circumcised him because of the Jews lived there in the area, for they all knew his father was Greek. Timothy was half Greek. Timothy was half Jewish. The Jewish part of the law that he was under required that he should have been circumcised on the eighth day. He was never circumcised. Paul circumcised him because he was of the Jewish... He, he, T Timothy spanned both, Gent Gent Gentiles and Judaism. So he circumcised him. But Titus was 100% Greek. Titus had nothing to do with the law. Uh, and that's why Paul didn't circumcise Titus. He didn't force the issue. And there were believers there that were 100% Gentile. They knew nothing of the law. Timothy did. Okay? And, and if you remember what it said about his mom, she was um, a Jewish, but she was a believer, a follower. But she was Jewish. She knew the law. And Timothy should have been circumcised. All right? So, uh, verse 4. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. Remember, there was a decision. They went up there. Paul and Barnabas, boy, they were up there, and they said, boy, I want to plead my case, and they did. They, you know, they went up there. This is 14 years after his conversion, because it says that in Galatians. Then after 14 years, I went up there. That's what it's talking about. But what was the decision? What, what does he say right here? He said, they traveled from town to town and delivered the decisions reached by the apostles. Do you remember what that was? It was a letter. And it's that letter I'm going to read to you right now. The churches were strengthened. But it was a simple little letter. It's found in Acts 15, 23 to 29. It's in your study guide from last week. But it was a simple little letter. It says, the apostles and the elders, your brothers. He wanted them, they, they, he addressed it like that. We're the apostles and the elders. We're your brothers. Even though you're Gentiles, we're your brothers. Okay? Do you remember, i, I got to go back into this because this is so important. Remember, Jews and Greeks weren't allowed to, to Jews and Gentiles weren't even allowed to associate. They were, uh, when they went into the house of the, uh, the centurion, remember? Peter went in there and he goes, we're not even supposed to associate with you guys in Acts 11. We're not even going to have dinner with you. But Timothy was half Jewish and half Greek. Somebody needed some association. <laughs> My point is, he wasn't what you'd call the best. If you were looking at it from a Jewish point of view, he was worse than a Samaritan. He was a half-breed. But God looked favorably on him because he believed. God doesn't look on the outer flesh like we do. He looks at the heart. He saw Timothy as a believer. But here's the letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We have heard that some have went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them uh, to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we're sending Judas, not Iscariot, this different Judas, and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You ought to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from uh, meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You do well to avoid these things. Farewell. That was it. They said, you know what? You're not under the law. You're under grace. Follow these few things. And that's all that's required. Okay? And that's what Paul went and took with him. Verse 6. We're going to look at our map right here. You got your map out right, right there? Because verse 6 it says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Pergia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. 
So let's look at the map right there. So Paul went through Pergia. Um, you see where the number three is on your map, following your little lines? That's Pergia. And Galatia is just to the right of that. And Galatia is the region where you find Lystra, Derby, Iconium. Then to the left of this, you'll see Asia. Uh, right below Thyatira, that region right there is called Asia. <coughs> and it says, the Holy Spirit uh, kept them from preaching to Asia. But what cities do you see right there in Asia? You see Ephesus, don't you? We have an epistle to the Ephesians called the Book of Ephesus. We have Thyatira, uh, mentioned in Revelation. We have a lot of different places. So Paul actually did go to Asia, even though the Holy Spirit stopped him. Because it wasn't the time for Paul to go to Asia. And I want to point that out. You know, God eventually allowed Paul to go to Asia, to Ephesus, to Ephesus, to Thyatira, to preach to these people. In fact, in Revelations, uh, when they talk about seven churches, Thyatira is one. You got Ephesus uh, uh, right there. So Paul eventually got to go there, but not at that time when he wanted to go. And a lot of times, when God will slow us down, he shuts the door. We think, God, why did I make you mad? Why aren't you opening the door for us? Well, you know, we want so bad to go here and minister, or to do this or to do that. And we feel like there's a closed door that we can't even begin to knock over, right? And a lot of times we think uh, that closed door must be the devil. And we start rebuking it. Oh God, this, the devil is trying to stop us from going to minister. The devil is stopping me from going here. The devil is stopping me from going there. It may not be the devil at all. It may be God. He's protecting us. Uh, example, we tried to move out here. Um, right now it's 2019, 2018, 17, 16, 2015. Um, we were going to move out here. We put the house up for sale. Maybe 14 or 15, somewhere in there. Uh, we put the house up for sale. I think it was 14. And we lived in a nice neighborhood in North Phoenix. Had a pool. I'm talking it was a nice pool. We had a, a sunken living room. Uh, a piano, you know, was in there. I built this wall. And on this wall, uh, we had guitars. Oh, uh, Jerry? Jesse. 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 Okay. Well, welcome. Come Sorry. on in. Sorry, I'll I was down right outside the time. Oh, so you met Julia, huh? I did. My daughter. Okay. Well, thank you. God was calling us to Buckeye. Now, remind you, I was going to Phoenix First Assembly. We were a big church. Things were good there. Uh, we loved life. Things were going good. But we felt a burden to come to Buckeye. So we put the house on the market. Remember, front neighborhood, we had sunk in living room, had a grand piano. We had a whole wall with guitars, beautifully, you know, it was a nice house. Granite countertops. A bunch of people came in through the house, but after 190 days, the house did not budge. Not one offer. And the whole time I'm thinking, God, do you really want us in Buckeye? Is this just us chasing our dream? Or is this your dream? We want to be part of your dream. You know, we want to, we want to do something for you, but... It's got to be your will. Mm -hmm. So we took it off the market. We prayed another year. And after praying for another year, we prayed. And you know what? We said, uh, God, we still believe it. You want us to go to Buckeye. And the previous year, we put the house on the market. The realtor told us it wouldn't sell for what we wanted. And he wanted to go less, and it still wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But we went in with the price we thought it should be. We prayed about it, fasted about it. Put it on the market on Friday. Saturday, someone came and looked at it. Monday, there was an offer. So basically, one weekend, the house sold. Mm -hmm. Full asking price. We came right. down. It was smooth. It was mm -hmm. a smooth transaction. Mm -hmm. And I say that because of this. Paul and, and Silas wanted to go preach in Asia, but God stopped them. It wasn't that he stopped them forever, because that's where Ephesus is. That's where Thyatira is. Eventually, they went there. But at that time, we didn't know, Paul didn't know what was happening in Asia Minor. Paul didn't know what was happening in Ephesus. If he would have went there, maybe he would have been killed. And, and the other churches may have never been ministered to. 
So when God stops us, it's not always the devil. So, you know, putting a roadblock up. Sometimes it's God protecting us. And wise is the person that will understand the difference between God shutting the door and God wrapping us in his arms. Sometimes it's, you know, one may look like the other, but sometimes it's God just holding us. All right? Uh, uh, verse 7, it says, They came to the border of Mysia. Uh, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to go. That's two roadblocks in a row for Paul. He wanted to go to Asia? Uh -uh. Nope. He wanted to go to Bithynia? Uh, nope. Boom. And if you look at your map up there, uh, Bithynia is right below the Black Sea, uh, right above Galatia. And God wouldn't have allowed them to go there. So Paul was trying to go to Asia, then Bithynia. God said, nope. So what did Paul do? He pressed west to, to Mysia. Okay? So they pressed to Mysia and went down to Tros. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So this is the famous Macedonian call. Paul was there, and in the middle of the night, he hears this vision of a man come to Macedonia to preach to us. Almost every missionary that's in the field can relate to this call somehow. They got a burden. There's a hunger. Maybe God's calling them to Asia. Maybe God's calling them to the Philippines or Africa or, or Russia or wherever. Maybe God's calling them to the reservation. Just like us, God was calling us to Buckeye. There was a call. Something was driving us out here. We didn't know what it was, but there was, a, there was like a call. Sometimes it's a physical person saying, hey, can you minister in our region or in our area? Sometimes it's just a burden we can't explain. That was the Macedonian call. Paul went up there and he began to preach in the churches. Now, if you were to look at your map again right there, see where Macedonia is? It's on the far uh, upper left of your map. Right now, that's in modern day, uh, uh, the, the uh, countries are North Macedonia. There's actually a country called North Macedonia. It's right above Greece. And Southeast Albania, Al Albania is north of Greece. So uh, Macedonia is that region right above Greece. Uh, verse 11, this is the other event that happens in verse uh, chapter 16. Uh, remember, Paul couldn't go to Asia. He couldn't go to Bithynia, so he went west. From Tralus, we put out the sea and sailed for uh, Samoth Trace. That's an island. If you go back and look at our map right there, there's a little bitty island, Samoth Trace. See it? All capital letters. That's where they landed there. Um, the next day, they went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and leading the city district of Macedonia. So it was Macedonia back then. And it says we stayed there several days. Verse 13. On the Sabbath day we went out to the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth. If you read the King James Version, it'll say the seller of purple. Um, she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. Uh, she said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now Lydia, there's some things about her. She's the seller of purple. Luke, who wrote this, remember, he was writing to a man named Theophilus uh, uh, to give an account of everything that was happening. He mentioned the seller of purple. Purple cloth was so rare in those days. The dye that we have, when we dye clothes, whether it be blue jeans, or whether we dye uh, a t-shirt black, or a t-shirt red, there are certain pigments and dyes that we can find. Some come from plants. Some come from, uh, there's a place in, I think, Maui that makes t-shirts out of a red rock. They actually throw rocks in the machine and sand and you get these t-shirts, but it's the pigment. 
purple pigment was something that was really, really hard to find. And if you sold purple, you became pretty wealthy. But you paid a price for that dye, too. But the biggest thing I want you to understand is she was the first European convert. She was the first person in Europe to come to Christ. Now, if you look at your map again, I want you to look at Philippi. See Philippi right there by Neapolis? You're thinking, how is that the first European convert? We know Paul ministered in Ephesus. He ministered in uh, Galatia. He ministered in Pergia. There were believers all out there. Why is she considered the first European convert? Anybody know? I'm going to show you something that's really kind of cool. If you look at your map, see the Black Sea? You'll see two peninsulas almost touching each other, like two fingers. There's a city that spans those two fingers, those peninsulas. The city was once called Constantinople. What's it called today? Istanbul. Istanbul. Istanbul is the only city in the world that spans both Europe and Asia. Asia and Europe start at that point, at that little point right there. If you can make a straight line through that sea, the Black Sea going into the, uh, uh, by, towards uh, uh, Greece, that's where Europe and Asia meet. So Lydia was the first European convert. So if someone ever asked you that in a trivia question, you know it's Lydia. All right? Uh, verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, <coughs> uh, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit which predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to, uh, to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Well, let's take a look at this little picture real quick. You got a girl following the Apostle Paul. Shout to everybody, listen to these men. They're going to tell you how to be saved. I'm thinking, what's wrong with that picture? She's telling them where to go. <laughs> these are the men that are going to bring you salvation. The thing is, she was loud, the Scripture tells us. That she was uh, interrupting the message. God is a God that is of um, peace. He's one that uh, he wants uh, uh, structure. You know, sometimes he goes outside the structure, but he he does he doesn't like disorder. If you go to First Corinthians fourteen thirty three, First Corinthians fourteen thirty three, it says, "For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace." as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Paul wrote that as he was talking about uh, the prophecies in the church, or uh, when it was one of the spoken tongues, gave an interpretation. He would say, listen, not everybody, not everybody all at once. Take your turn. Let it be a peaceful gathering. Because if everyone's shouting, who's hearing the message? And the same thing with this. The girl, she was shouting and shouting. It says right here she was very loud. Uh, verse 17. She followed Paul and the rest shouting. These men are the servant of the Most High God. And Paul just had enough of it. You know, they didn't have Excedra back then. They didn't have Tylenol. They didn't have aspirin. They had rebuking. <laughs> That's what he did. He said, bye-bye. You know? But, and uh, the Spirit left her. Verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Into the marketplace. That's where the authorities were. You know, they didn't bring him to a building. They said, you guys coming out by the fountain out here. We're going to do it the old school way. And they just put them out there. And one thing when I was reading this, I thought to myself, you know, wicked people, they don't care that people are set free. Here you have a girl that was possessed by a demon. They didn't care about her freedom. They cared about money. What they were losing by her being free. I think about drug dealers. They don't care that people uh, are in bondage to drugs. 
They just want to keep selling their product. When a drug addict gets saved and clean, they get furious because they lost one more customer. I think about sex trafficking. When they bring these young girls in the prostitution, this, that, and the other. They don't care that these girls are bondage to prostitution. And they don't even care that they're set free as long as they keep making their money. And that's the wickedness. They want to put bondage on people. And that's all they wanted for her. When I read the story, I think about drug addiction. I think about alcoholism. I think about the sex trade. That was the same thing. They did not care about that girl, just what the girl could bring them financially. And when you read the Bible, it's so relevant to today. We see it all around us. People, they, they don't care about people. Just what can I make money-wise from them? Uh, verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates. Magistrates is just a fancy word for judges. And said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack of Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Wow. This is all taking place in the city gate. There's no trial. There's just people complaining. A mob shows up. These guys are guilty. And the magistrates ordered them to be beaten by rods. Look at verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, severely, not just a little bit, not a slap on the hand, no trial. They just flogged them severely. They threw them into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. You know, most of us would probably die from a beating like that. You know, there was no antibiotics back then, no AMD ointment. There was no, you know, triple A. You know, Grace is a nurse, so I see she has ointments all the time. Little antibiotic ointments. Those things work, by the way. But they didn't have anything like that. And you know, those cells aren't like the prisons today, you know, where I'm at the somewhat clean. These ones are, you know, I'm thinking of the Count of Monte Cristo. You guys ever see that movie? Edmund Dantes, it's your anniversary. And they went on. But there was like hay on the floor. And I, I can't imagine the cold, damp prisons these guys are sitting in with their open wounds and their sores, the stench, because the feces that are in there, the, the rats probably running around, all these different things. These guys are sitting in there. And this guy is ordered to watch them carefully. So you know he's only an arm you know, away. He's not walking too far from there. Because he said, watch them carefully. And what's verse 25 said? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. I wonder what hymns they were singing. You know, we sing like some glad morning when this life is over. They were probably singing the songs as a deer pants for the waters, our God is a mighty God, just singing the songs of David or something. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundation of the prisons were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up when he saw the prison doors that opened, he drew his sword out and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners were about to escape. He knew. Because he, he probably beat people before himself. He knew if he would let these guys go, he would be tortured and beat. He figured taking his own life would be simpler and easier and less painful. But verse 28 says, Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. Now, do you remember when I said earlier that not every shut door is of the devil? Mm -hmm. Not every open door is of God. Mm -hmm. Just because you see a door open doesn't mean you need to run through it. We need to be prayerfully, every day, considering God, what do you want in our lives? You know, it, it, guide me today. Give me wisdom. Sometimes if there's an open door, it may not be of God. They could have easily have left, but if they did, that prisoner would have been killed, or the guard, and this whole family wouldn't have came to Christ. Mm -hmm. But they came to Christ. Um, it's important to recognize uh, the uh, uh, God's will in that area for us. Verse 29, it says right here, the jailer called for lights, 
rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So I want you to picture this right here. As I was studying this, I was picturing this. You know, I'm thinking this old, dingy, darkened cave. There was no lights. They had to bring lights and torches. So it was dark. You're hearing rats. You're hearing moans and groans from other prisoners. The, the, the smell, the stench, all this. And the prisoners just outside, the, the guards outside the door, because he doesn't want to see them let go. But he's sleeping somewhere, so he's somewhere nearby. And they work hard, the soldiers, so he's trying to get some sleep. And at midnight, Paul and Silas begin singing praises to God. And you know what? He's probably thinking, boy, just let me in there. I'll give them the something to sing about. You know, I'll let me at them. Tell those guys need to shut up. You know what? I'm the one in charge here. Just let me at them. But at the same time, the words are singing somehow are touching this man's heart. God's word doesn't return void. Especially if it's the word of God that we're singing. They don't return void. And something's ministering to this man that he doesn't understand everything. But when the prison doors are open, they're still there. He realized that's a miracle of God because he could have lost his life right there. He came trembling and fell before Paul. What must I do to be saved? It sank in. You know, he's probably heard him for the last hour or two singing. You know, what must I do to be saved? Uh, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The message of the gospel was so simple, and it should be so simple today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your household will be saved. Verse 32. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to the others in the house. At that hour of the night, at that hour of the night, uh, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and, they, and immediately he and his household were baptized. Baptism was so important to the early church and it needs to be important to us now. Do you remember uh, back in Acts chapter 8, you had Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Philip says, well, what are you reading there? And he says, I'm reading Isaiah, but I don't understand what's going on. Can you show me? Philip begins to tell him all about Christ, how he fulfilled what he's reading right there in Isaiah. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Even he understood the importance of baptism, not knowing the full gospel. And boom, he was baptized. These guys, the minute they believed, were baptized. Mm -hmm. Baptism is important. Uh, the jailer brought them back into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. If there's one verse that describes the Christian walk, it's this one. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. If we have Christ in our life, that should be us, filled with joy. Me and our house. When you walk into my household, I want my home, I want you to feel joy. I want you to feel peace. I want you to walk in there as if Christ himself was standing in there. And if we live our lives in such a way like that, that Christ is actually walking, we're reflecting him at such a close Wow, that's amazing. Hey, have you guys ever seen Venus in the early morning sky, that bright star that's out there? Oh, yeah. It's real brighter. Do you know why that's so bright? It's not the biggest planet. It's proximity to the sun. It's close. That's why it reflects so brightly. Imagine we as Christians, if we walk so closely to Christ, that we reflect His glory in what we say and what we do. We shine the way God wants us to shine. Shine. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's my goal. Amen? <laughs> That's my goal. Uh, verse 35. When it was daylight, the magistrates, those are the judges, remember, uh, sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. They suffered enough, release them, you know, basically. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. You can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial. Even though we are Roman citizens, they threw us into prison. And now they want to get rid of us so quietly? No. 
Let them come and escort us out themselves. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Paul knew what tools he had at his disposal. Each of you, including myself, we all have tools at our disposal. We have things that are unique to us that we can use for the gospel. Paul knew what he had. We need to understand what tools we have at our disposal. Because Paul used them like, boy, a beautiful sword. Uh, verse 38. The officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard what Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escort them out of prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house. And there they met with brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. This is the uh, first part, really, of uh, the second missionary journey of Paul. Next week, we'll be in Acts 17, where we'll be in the second part of Paul's second missionary journey. Hope you can make it. It is just an awesome experience. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time before you. Uh, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. We thank you for your words. Just jumping off the page, uh, telling us a story, painting us a picture. Lord God, these are our brothers and sisters in faith. Even though it was 2,000 years ago, every day is the same to you. It's like they're here with us now. It's like we're there with them. God, help us to take and have that courage that they had to spread the gospel. Lord, we give you the glory, honor, and praise that you deserve. Thank you.